All right, good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. <clears throat> God bless you. Uh, welcome tonight uh, to our wonderful time of Village Bible Study. Uh, let me thank God for all of you uh, that are present um, and accounted for on tonight. Uh, if you are on Zoom, please share the Zoom link uh, with as many persons as you desire. If you are on Facebook, welcome tonight. Uh, we're excited to have you on Facebook tonight. And of course, uh, we welcome you and encourage you to please share uh, with any and everybody that you know as well. And so um, if you're on YouTube, that's right, YouTube and the website, uh, thank you all so much. Uh, please feel free uh, to share our time of study together. I'm so excited uh, to be back with you tonight. Uh, let me thank Reverend Marlow, <clears throat> who in my absence on last week, as I did something that I haven't done in quite some time, uh, traveled and preached a revival in Chicago, Illinois, uh, for the DuPage AME Church. Uh, my uh, little sister, Kenitra uh, Houston Dickens, is the pastor and preached three nights, uh, which is something I haven't done since COVID or during COVID. So it is 701. Let's pray. God, we bless you. God, we honor you. God, we exalt you. God, we thank you. God, we glorify you. Thank you, God, for this middle of the week. Uh, this evening experience, this time of study uh, and studying your word. Thank you for guiding us all day. Thank you for keeping us. Uh, thank you for walking with us. Thank you for watching over us. And now, God, as we come to the evening hour, pray now that you will be with us in this time of study. Illuminate our hearts and our minds so that we might receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's children said, thank God <clears throat> and amen. All right. Well, we got a long way to go tonight. We got to finish this chapter so we can get to chapter four next week. So we got a long way to go tonight. So we're going to move uh, with haste uh, on tonight. And so we pick back up in part five. If I can have the outline of part five up, uh, we, we pick up in part five. We've already done letter A, I believe, of part five. And so tonight... Uh, we're moving into letter B, uh, part five, and it is coming on the screen. This is where we are tonight. Uh, this is part five, um, and we will study uh, 10 through 14, and then we're going to move into part six. We're going to move into part six after the completion of part five. All right, so if we can put uh, the scriptures on the screen, verses 10 through 14 at this time. verses 10 through 14 of Galatians chapter 3. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On, contrary, on the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. That's good. For it is written, curse is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Amen. All right. Remember now um, our topic for this particular uh, part, which is part five, was bewitched into foolishness. Bewitched into foolishness. And so we dealt with that word. Uh, bewitched. And let me start off by asking you all this question. It is actually in the book, and many of you all have purchased the book, so you probably have seen this already. Um, and I want a quick answer, so we're going to do this real quickly. Um, twice Paul calls the Galatians Christians foolish. 
He does it in verse one and verse three. In what senses is it foolish to add works to the gospel of Christ? So I'm gonna ask you this question. Was Paul being insulting and in calling them foolish? Or is Paul saying their decision-making when it comes to following Christ is what's foolish? So I'm asking you tonight, why is Paul using such strong language to the people of Galatia, in particular the Gentiles, who are now switching positions? All right, I just want to see your responses. I just want to hear your responses. There's no wrong answer. Just want to see your responses. So now start processing that, uh, getting the answer to that. And I'm um, going to give you about 30 seconds, and then we're going to type it. Start typing it, but don't hit send. On social media, don't hit send. Don't hit send until we count down. Y'all remember we do the waterfall. So start formulating your thoughts. Uh, I want to see from you, uh, was Paul being insulting? Do you think, first of all, he's being insulting? Or what context in which is he using the word foolish? All right. Here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Send it. All right, send it. Oh, not a No, okay. Foolish means unlearned, yet the Galatians should know about grace, okay. Stern, okay. Let me see social media, anybody responding? Okay. All right, well, we'll go on. Okay, see a couple of response. He's not being insulting but righteous indignation. All right, cool. All right, let's proceed tonight. Um, I see more ascending in, not insulting, but very forward. All right, here we go. So now let's deal with this whole piece. We're in part five now. Let's deal with this whole piece. Paul has is, is used the word foolish and all of that now. And so what he's basically saying is, it's totally illogical to place law over faith. When you look at verses 10 through 14, that's precisely what the apostle is saying. Illogical means lacks sense. Illogical means lacks clarity. Illogical also means lacks reasoning. So Paul says, putting law over faith lacks reasoning. It don't make sense. It's what Paul is saying. So he now adds another layer. Uh, here it is to how foolish it would be for the people of Galatia to switch positions. So once again, yes, he's talking about their decision making to move from here to there. Paul says would be an unwise decision. That's another word for foolish, unwise. Paul firmly shares that the law cannot justify anybody. <clears throat> and that's his point. Who can the law justify? It has no authority to justify anybody. It only condemns. And that's the problem that Paul has. The only thing that the law could ever do is condemn. It provides nothing. It provides no way of escape. It provides no grace. It provides no new opportunities or a second or third opportunity. It provides none of that. And Paul says it's illogical to place the law over faith. And so the law, according, I want our communication team to put up what Paul is quoting. He's really quoting Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26. Deuteronomy chapter 27. Uh, verse 26. And so basically, it'll come up on the screen at some point. Anyone placed under a curse did not follow the law without stumbling. 
Cursed is anyone who does not uphold the words of this law by carrying them out. Then all the people shall say, Amen. So what is Paul pointing out to us? All of us tonight would be under a curse because all of us have stumbled and all of us at some point have broken the law. And that's really what Paul's tension is tonight. That's really what his argument is. Uh, the law allows no room for reconciliation, for forgiveness. The law says of Deuteronomy, which he's been quoting, 27 and 26, Paul is clear. If you break the law, you are under a curse. But it never says, how do I get from up under the curse? So now you all see tonight why Paul is having such a problem with the Galatians choosing to go with the law over faith. He's saying, man, there is no escape. Once you break the law, you're done. There is no way out. That's it. Simple as that. He says it makes no sense when you've been saved by faith and saved by grace. It makes no sense for you to go now at this point and switch back to the law for your salvation. And you will hear more about this when we uh, get to the uh, end of this chapter, when we look uh, into part six tonight. See, the law demanded perfection. In order to be under the law, you had to be perfect. And that's why God had no problem wiping people out that did not obey the law. You had to be perfect in every sense. So anyone who fell short of the law would be cursed. So if and I'm not going to ask tonight on Zoom or social media how many of us are perfect because ain't nobody going to raise their hand. So that means under the law, you would be cursed. Because in order to win, to achieve under the law, and this is why Paul is making this whole argument. He's, he's not trying to insult the Galatians. He's not trying to speak in a derogatory or demeaning way to them when he talks about foolish, bewitched. Paul says, in fact, he says, you got to be bewitched to be willing to do this. <laughs> you got to be under a spell or curse or something, man, to be willing to do this. And so uh, I want us to think about tonight, faith versus the law. Faith versus the law. Later on, I'm going to get to the promises versus the law. But for now, I want to deal with faith versus the law. Can we put verses 10, 11, and 12? Verses 10, 11, and 12 of Galatians chapter 3. Will we put that up, please? All right, here it comes. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written, curses everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. That was Deuteronomy 27, right? So clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous live by what? The righteous live by what? Yes, the righteous live by faith. Then verse 12. The law is not based on faith. There it is. Y'all can remove it. The law is not based on faith. There's nothing about the law that is based on faith. Nothing. The law, in other words, breaking one command at least once puts you under a curse. The breaking of one command will put you, sisters and brothers, under a curse. Thou shall not covet thy neighbor's house, nor thy neighbor's wife, nor thy neighbor's ox, nor thy neighbor's ass. Coveting, wanting to be like your neighbor, watching your neighbor. 
you break that commandment. So that means every nosy person would be under a curse. Every person that's been in somebody else's business other than yours, including your children, including your family, you're in a business, then you are under a curse because you could be charged with coveting. Can't be in nobody else's business. So if you break that, that puts you under a curse. But Habakkuk says in chapter two and verse four, the righteous shall live by faith, which means I don't have to see it in order to believe it. The righteous shall live by faith. Paul is clear. The law is not based on faith. And he, he also presents here, and we're going to see it further tonight in our continued dialogue. He, he presents what I would call a possible compromise of faith and law being combined, but law can never be over faith. He says faith and law can be combined. And he talks about that when he says, the one who does these things will live by them. Isn't that the law? Laws are what? Things that you live by. Things that you abide by. Things uh, that you try not to break. So when Paul says, the one who does these things will live by them, Paul says, I have nothing wrong with law and order. I have nothing wrong, nothing wrong with the law. That's, that's not a problem for me. Paul said, the only problem for me is when you put faith under the law. I can deal with faith being over the law. And so for Paul, it is illogical, illogical to be justified by the law because that requires perfection. It requires a perfect performance. And Paul says, man, when I think about this, ain't nobody but Jesus is gonna be saved. Because Jesus is the only perfect being. So for Paul, the Galatians have, must have lost their everlasting mind. And that's why he says, y'all either have been bewitched or you have turned foolish. Paul says it's either or. I don't know which one it is. Either you are under a spell and somebody has come here and put some witchcraft on you or you don't lost your everlasting mind. And that's when he uses the word foolish uh, because he says, if you think your imperfect behinds are somehow ready now to abide by the law, this law is going to put you out and this law is going to seek to snatch salvation from you. So Paul is, is clear tonight. He said, now I can, I can deal with this whole thing of faith versus law, but I can never compromise and deal with law being over faith. Let's continue on. Let's look at verses 13 and 14. Can we put that on the screen, please? Excuse me, verse 13 and verse 14. As we're waiting on that to appear. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who is hung on a pole. Next one. He redeemed us. Yes, Lord. Thank you. <laughs> he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So that by faith, God, thank you. So that by faith, we might receive the promise of the spirit. Leave it there. Leave it there. So that by the law, we might receive the promise of the spirit. So that by our deeds, we might receive the promise of the spirit. So that by our piety, we might receive the promise of the spirit. So that by our holiness, we might receive the promise of the spirit, no. So that by faith, 
there it is. We might receive the promise of the spirit. So what is Paul saying? Look, look, look at verse 14. It's on the screen. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through who? Christ Jesus. Not through Abraham. Not through Moses. Not through Joshua. Uh, not, not through David. Not through Samuel. Not through any of the minor or major prophets. He says, no. Through Christ Jesus. That's how we are redeemed when I in my preaching say let the redeemed of the Lord that's those of us that have benefited from the works of Jesus Christ all of us are beneficiaries of the works of Jesus Christ. What is the work of Jesus Christ? He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. It didn't say through the Jews. It didn't say through any other group of people. It says through Christ Jesus. You remember, there's this tension Paul is dealing with between Jews and Gentiles, that he got upset with Peter for leaving the Gentiles when there was fellowship between and a bond developing between the Jews and Gentiles. But yet, Peter gets up, walks away from the table. Y'all remember in the second chapter? And because of that, he get other people to follow his hypocrisy and all of that stuff. But what I want you to see tonight is that the work of Jesus Christ offers hope unto us. That's it. This is a great Advent text, by the way. The works of Jesus Christ. That's why we are redeemed. That's why we are in the lineage of Abraham. Why we can receive the blessing that God spoke to Abraham. All right, thank you, communication team. Awesome. So I wanted y'all really to see that scripture so that it could sit with you. That's the works of Christ on our behalf, y'all. Because our imperfect selves would have never been able to receive any of that. And it is because of Christ that we have received it. So the work of Christ offers us hope. Uh, that's number two under letter B on your handout. And so Paul never leaves us hanging. And that's what I love about it. He, he never leaves us hanging. The hope that exists that Paul is talking about tonight, the hope that exists is that Christ's death would in fact redeem us from the curse of the law. Now it gets good. So why would I put law over faith when Christ's death redeemed me from the curse of the law? For those who have broken the law, the only reason we are not under a curse is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ's redemptive work allowed us, the Gentiles, to receive the blessing given to Abraham. And by faith, we also receive the Holy Spirit. And Paul reminds the Galatians that because of Christ, salvation and sanctification is possible by faith and not by the law. So I tried to give you all of that to give you the context of what Paul is becoming so frustrated by. Now y'all can see why he said, man, this foolish. <laughs> You can't do this. No. Don't do it. If you go for this, you will never, never receive the blessing of Abraham. But if you 
believe by faith, then you can be placed in that lineage. And so Paul says, man, don't do it. He said, don't do it, don't do it. So we just finished that whole section, bewitched into foolishness. Now at 725, how, how can I capture that whole part five for you today? Don't you let nobody get you in no foolishness. <laughs> Don't you let them do it. Uh-uh. You tell them, no, no, I cannot do that. Christ has been too good to me. Christ has redeemed me. And here is the foolishness. I always like to give an example of how people get you caught up in some foolishness. Come on, you know you used to do that. You know you used to act like that. You, you know, don't act brand new on us. Uh-uh, don't you let them bewitch you. You tell them right there to their face, you're not going to bewitch me. <laughs> no, no, no. You're not going to get me caught up in no foolishness. Uh-uh. Christ has delivered me from that, and I'm not going back to that. Amen. All right, we got to go. It's 726. I got to go because I got a whole nother section to deal with. Can y'all put the outline up for part six? Because I got to go. We got to run now. Part six. Put the outline up. Yeah, 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 yeah. There it is. So what are we going to deal with tonight? We're going to talk about the pros and cons of the law. The inadequacies of the law and the purpose of the law, right? That's what we're going to deal with. And we're dealing with the rest of this chapter, verses 15 through 29. All right, can you show the second page? And then we're going to talk about, because I got to finish this tonight, the good news about the law and promise. The one good thing about the law, Paul said, I ain't got a whole lot to say about it, but I got one good thing to say about it. Then he's going to talk about the good news about the promise. So that's what we're getting ready to do, you all. That, that's where we are. Uh, you should have received this earlier um, in your um, email, eblast. Uh, you should already receive this. So let's go 15 through 20, verses 15 through 20. Let's rock and roll. Let's rock and roll. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seed, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this, this is going, this good right here. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise, not through a law, through a promise. Why then? Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. All right, uh, let's, let's unpack this. I, I like this. this. This is good here. Uh, now let's deal with the pros and cons. We're gonna, let's deal with the pros and cons um, of the law. That's what Paul just laid out for us, y'all. He laid out the pros and cons of the law. Uh, the, he revealed uh, the pros and cons of the law with one word, promise. The word promise, if you listen carefully, was used six times in those verses. Well, if I'd have read to 23, it would have been used six times. And then promise involves what? Being justified by faith and not by the law. That's it. If you want to really grasp all that stuff I just read real quickly, all Paul is saying, the law does not give you a promise. The only way that you receive the promises of God are how? By faith. That's it. So 
That's, that's the thing about the law for Paul. It don't get me nothing. But one thing, I'll get to that later. Paul's opponents, now the Judaizers at this time were making an argument based upon the law. Their argument was that the law, although years later, how many years? The text said, I believe it said 430 years later. And Paul is saying, hold up. The law cannot come late to the party and change the process of salvation. Y'all know what that sounds like? Listen to what he's saying. The law shows up late, and now the law tries to cancel out the promise. Or the law tries to adjust the process of receiving the promise. That's like a person that finally climbs whatever ladder they're climbing, and then they get up there, and now they change the whole process they went through to get up there. What are you saying, Slaughter? They turn around and make it harder for you to get up there where they are. Paul says, I'm not going to let y'all do that to me. <laughs> I work too hard to let y'all come in here and try to change the process of salvation. Uh-uh-uh. Y'all not going to come here and try to add that law. See, for them, salvation is not simply, for the Judaizers, salvation is not simply achieved by faith, but it includes following the law and not breaking the law. So the Judaizers are saying, we can accept this faith thing that you're talking about, but we cannot accept it void or absent of the law. If you can accept the law, we accept the faith, and then we'll do law and faith. Paul's going to talk about that in a minute, too. Uh, but Paul says, justification by faith cannot be changed by some law 430 years later. If Abraham was considered righteous by faith and not by the law, Paul says, you're not changing the game on me now. You're not changing. And y'all, believe it or not, I'm getting ready to get in some trouble now. And I know it's all over social media and all that, but I'm going to say it. See, people always change the rules when it comes to us. It changed the rules. Let me give y'all something that's going on right now, and you've heard of it, and I'm sure some have talked about it. Let me show you how the rules are different. And this is what Paul is fighting for equality right now in terms of religion. Kyrie Irving, right out of Essex County, and now the Nets giving him Six check boxes he got to check on for something because of him sharing something they call anti-Semitic. I haven't watched it. I ain't going to watch it. It ain't got nothing to do with me. Um, but my problem is Kyrie Irving shared it, but Jeff Bezos is selling it. So how can Kyrie share something that's anti-Semitic, but Jeff Bezos gets away with uh, selling something that's anti-Semitic? Black and white. Like the old TVs in the 80s. It's black and white. It's clear as black and white. That, that's what it is. It's playing in movie theaters now. And nobody has went to the movie theater to stop that whatever Kyrie shared. I don't even know what it is because I ain't watched it. And I'm not going to watch it. Because there is no hate in me. And I don't believe there's no hate in Kyrie, to be quite honest with you, when he has grew up in a whole Jewish community in West Orange, went to schools, driven there by Jewish persons. 
but nobody calling Jeff Bezos' name. It's playing right there on Springfield Ave in Newark, in Shaq's movie theater. This whole thing that Kyrie shared. So if you look at what Paul is saying in that light, Paul is saying we're not going to have two processes over here. No, it, it's going to be one. And, and that's exactly what we're going to abide by. So Paul quotes the Old Testament, the law, not because he has a problem with it. He don't have a problem with the law. Paul believes the law has its place. But he's arguing tonight and debating that God's way of salvation has always been by grace through faith and not by grace through the law. Paul says, y'all not doing this. And he's saying to the people of Galatia, don't y'all get caught up in this foolishness. Uh-uh, don't get caught up in these two paths. Your faith is good enough. It's not about the law. And so he begins to point out the inadequacies of the law. Can I see verses 15 through 18 again? The inadequacies of the law. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. It didn't say anything about seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, singular. And Paul interprets that to mean Christ, verse 17. What I mean is this. I'm going to stop right here. Paul said, <laughs> the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. Y'all take it away. Paul uses some old language of antiquity here. He's saying, man, I'm grandfathered in. <laughs> Y'all ain't gonna change these rules on me now. I'm grandfather in. And the reason that election and all these elections are so important, because now you got the Supreme Court dealing with this whole notion uh, in terms of college admission now. Now they're trying to go back and say this as if all race issues have been resolved, that there is no longer any need for affirmative action because blacks are now treated equal. I don't know what universe they're living in. <laughs> for them to really believe all blacks are treated equal, to really believe that the blacks that got into Harvard, Yale, and some of these Ivy League schools got there without Yale or Harvard or Ivy Leagues making sure that they check the box of a certain percentage of people of color. If you think as smart as our people are, they're going to let you up in there. If they don't feel like somebody's watching, or in the words of Paul, there's a law to make them do it, you're losing your mind. You see it all over the place. Them trying to turn back the clock. Look at voting in some states, what they make you go through just to be able to vote. They're trying to turn it back, y'all. And if we ain't careful and we fall asleep, Paul is trying to wake us up tonight. But if we fall asleep, we're going to be in a world of trouble, man. And that's, that, that's my concern about this. What, what generation, uh, Kyla, is our, our kid? Generation Z? Z. I think I'm X. Yeah, I'm X. So, yeah, they generation Z. I, I lose track. Y'all have to forgive me. They Z or something, millennials and Z. My concern about them, if they are not in tune with their history and what our people have been through as a race in this country, 
If they are not in tune to that man, they're going to be in a world of trouble. They're going to be lunch for some of these people. And so what Paul is saying in pointing out the pros and cons of the law, Paul makes it clear that the law does not have the sole authority or the power to save. He points out that the law has no authority to cancel the promise. When he's talking about it in verse 15, he said a contract has already been signed. Y'all cannot come back and undo that contract that God signed with Abraham. The law was given 430 years later after the promise. So he's saying, how can y'all override the promise? Uh, communication team, I'm talking, but put up verse 15 again. God established the promise. God established the covenant long before God approved of the law. And that's what he's saying. Here is coming down, verse 15. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. Y'all leave it on the screen. Paul's saying, no, 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 no. It ain't no addendum to this covenant. Now, you can add the law all you want, but you cannot make the law fit into a covenant. You can't add to it. Why, Paul? Because it's already been signed. Who signed it? God. Who agreed to it? Abraham. So Paul is saying, you can't set aside or add nothing when a covenant has already been established. It's done. All right, you can remove it. That's like, let me give you, here it is. That's like somebody dying and you try to change the wheel after they did. You can't do it. You can't add. You can't delete. The person is gone. You got to adhere to what they left. So the Judaizers believe that giving of the law should alter the covenant or the promise. And Paul has argued in verse 15. Y'all saw it. I, no, you cannot just come here and do what you want to do. You're not going to add something 430 years later to the covenant. Yes, you can have the law. Paul is, he, he's given that. But Paul is saying, listen, y'all not going to come and change this covenant. Um, uh, no, this covenant was signed, sealed, delivered between God and Abraham. He's saying, no, uh, no. to do so would be to alter God's covenant to alter God's word, to alter God's agreement. And God never did that. The only person Paul is saying that has the authority to change anything is the owner, the author, the establisher of the covenant. And God never authorized it. So for Paul, the promise is, the original agreement, the Gentiles can have a piece of this promise and salvation because God said so. And there cannot be any changes. Promise is the original agreement and the only one that can make the changes is the person who made the agreement and that's God. Therefore, Paul is saying what? The law to him has his fair share of inadequacies. Paul says, it's just, I'm just being point blank. It's insufficient. The law has its share. Now, what the Judaizers wanted to do, let me give you what one, um, uh, what one Greek scholar suggested. He suggested what the, uh, what the Judaizers wanted to do uh, was to add to God's grace and subtract from God's promises. <laughs> they just wanted to come and use their editorial license and just take God's contract and God's covenant with Abraham and add to God's grace, but to subtract from God's promises. And Paul says, y'all ain't got no right to do that because none of y'all were part of the original agreement. You weren't the original parties that took place. I hope y'all are getting this. And so 
what is the purpose of the law then, Paul? Uh, the purpose of the law, Paul is very clear. The law was added because of people like you and people like me who committed transgressions. Paul said the law was added because y'all were taking advantage of God. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Y'all know you were misbehaving. God drew a line in the sand. Did y'all grow up in that time when you draw a line in the sand when you used to get into a fight and you say, now nah, if you cross that line, it's gonna be, we're going to get into a fight now if you cross that line. Paul is saying, God, that's what transgressions are. Paul says, God drew the line and your butt not only got close, you just came on over. And then you try to come on back. Then you go back over. Then you come on back. And you kept transgressing. You kept transgressing. So let's look at verse 19. Look at verse 19. So Paul says, basically, uh, God had to add the law to put a check in place for our sins. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions. That's it. Because of what? Transgression. How did we get the law? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, and with all of thy mind. How do we get the law? Thou shalt not commit adultery. How do we get the law? Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not covet. I know it's been a while since we did the Ten Commandments, but y'all know the Ten Commandments. How did we get that law? Because people were transgressing. People were crossing the line. But guess what? He says it was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. All right, y'all remove that. Uh, uh, before Christ, the mediator were angels. But when Jesus showed up, oh man, the transgression was added to put a check on our sin. So the law was basically equal to God drawing a line, as I said, and saying, if you cross this line, you're going to receive my wrath, you're going to receive my punishment. The law was also temporary, though, because once Christ arrived, the law would no longer be able to keep you under the curse. The promises did not didn't involve a mediator, but the law did. Don't, don't miss that. The promises didn't have a mediator. Because God was the originator of the other. No, the promises did not have a mediator because God was the originator of the promise agreement. But the law always had a mediator, sisters and brothers. So Paul's saying that the law was in fact temporary. How could it ever be greater than a permanent covenant like blessings that was given to Abraham? Nothing about God's promise to Abraham was conditional. There were no if you do this, or if you do that, then you can receive this, or you can receive that. God didn't give a promise like parents give the children. God did not give a promise like we give in relationships. Well, if you do this, I'll do that. No, God just gave the promise to Abraham without all of those restraints. The only way you could be blessed by the law was to meet certain conditions. God gave the law through mediators like angels and Moses. When God gave a promise, God did that directly. So if y'all don't get nothing else tonight, you, you ought to capture that. Capture that in your notes. God gave the law through mediators. He gave it through Moses. You remember when Moses came down from that mountain, then he gave them those commandments. We're going to love the Lord thy God. Just Jesus came and added that one. But when he gave those commandments, I am the Lord thy God that brought the other land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Then when he talked about the Sabbath day and to keep it holy, I shall even do all thy work, but on the Sabbath, 
God gave that to Moses. Moses came down, gave it to the people. But when God gave the promise, God did that in himself. He didn't need no mediator. That's your shout tonight. Whenever God gives a promise, he don't have to give it to no bell hop. He don't have to give it to no bell boy or bell woman. You don't have to give it to no preacher. God gives you the promise directly. So Paul's biggest argument was the law was temporary, but the covenant was permanent. That's, that's another good one for you tonight. The law was temporary, but the covenant was permanent. Now, I got to hurry on. I got nine minutes. The good news about the law and promise, verses 21 through 29, I'm not going to put all those verses up tonight. I got to hurry on. The apostle could be charged now with making a paradoxical statement, a contradictory statement. That's really what he's making now. Uh, when he pivots to discuss and talk about the possibilities of the benefits of the law. But he ain't going to talk about one. The one benefit of the law for Paul, <laughs> he said, the only thing I can concede tonight that I'm grateful about the law is because it led to Jesus Christ. And it led to us receiving Christ. He said, that's the only good news I, I can talk to you about tonight. Matter of fact, y'all go ahead and put it up. Verses 21 through 29. I'm just going to keep talking. Paul says, I'm the only thing I'm, I'm agreeing with y'all tonight. I'm cool with the law. And the only reason I'm cool with the law tonight, Paul says, is because the law brought us Jesus. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had, had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. <laughs> You ain't never heard nobody say you were considered righteous because of the law. No. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in the custody under the law. Listen at this description. You know, Paul, y'all can tell Paul been in jail. Listen at it. Listen at it. He been in jail. <laughs> he said, coming of this faith, we have been held in the custody under the law. We've been locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until what? Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that, this faith has come. Paul says, I don't need no guardian. <laughs> so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male nor and female for you are one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heir seed and heirs according to the promise. Thank you. That, that talks itself. Y'all see that? That talks itself, sisters and brothers. Paul said, the one good thing I can give you about this, this whole thing y'all talking about. He says, verse 24, the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. He reminds us that the law led to Jesus being born. That's the only thing he gonna celebrate about the law. But then he said, what? Now, since Jesus is here, I don't need no guardian. <laughs> I don't need y'all watching over me. Y'all already done locked me up with this law. Uh-uh, I'm free now. That's why I said Jew nor Gentile. No slave, no free. Uh uh. For Paul, the law and all actuality, it cooperates with the promise in fulfilling the purpose of God. What's the purpose of God? I'm talking about purpose driven this month. What's the purpose of God? Get Jesus here. What got Jesus here? You were tired of being locked up. And Jesus came, what? And set you free. And that's why y'all. We shout sometime and we say what? Whom the son has set free is what? Is free indeed. 
Because Paul says, you were locked up. You needed a guardian. <laughs> that means you couldn't go nowhere. And then Jesus showed up. So Paul wants the Judaizers to realize there is nothing life-changing or life-giving about your law. Your law does nothing in the area of adding anything to spiritual life. But what your law did, the one good thing your law did, that's in verses 21 through 25, he said, is that it worked together with the promise of God to bring sinners to Christ Jesus. And that's what he's concluding tonight. He unashamedly believes the law was put in place. He believes it was all the purpose of God the whole time to allow that law to be put in place to get Jesus Christ here. Because there cannot be any forgiveness of sins without the shedding of some blood. And he shed a whole lot of blood on that cross. Paul said, I can agree about one thing, and that thing is the law is responsible for us having a savior. He said, I can agree with that. And he confuses the Judaizers. That's what he's doing now. He's messing them up, y'all. He confuses them because he was able to find something good about their law. He had been beating them up so long about there was nothing good about the law and that he was able to finally now give them something good. He said, yeah, I give y'all some good. The only good thing about y'all, y'all help Jesus get here a whole lot quicker and I thank God for it. The law was created a sense of guilt. It created a sense of guilt and need for us to have someone like Jesus Christ. The law divided Jews and Gentiles, which is a reminder of why we needed a savior. So even in the midst of discovering so many flaws in the law, Paul was able to find something good. Don't y'all miss that tonight. In the midst of discovering so many flaws with the law, Paul still was able to find something good. You ought to be able to find something good about something, y'all. Paul couldn't stand the law, but he found something good about it. And what did he find good about it? He said, the law got Jesus here. And so since it's, I'm all right with it, I got one good thing. He didn't say nothing else about it. He had one good thing he can say about it. And that is, Jesus came as a result. So what's the good news about the promise? I end tonight, we right on time. I got all through it because I want to get to chapter four chapter five and chapter six before we take our Christmas break. Uh, the good news about the promise, the promise of God is not canceled because of the law. That's verse 26 through 29. The promise of God is not canceled because of the law. The promise ensures equity and freedom along with the cancellation of division. That's why Paul likes the promise. It cancels out division. We are now one in Christ Jesus. Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. We're one. That's what he's saying in verse 28. That's the good news about the promise. It makes us one. The seed of the promise. Verse 29, as I end tonight, the seed of the promise, and I tell y'all, has no expiration date. There's no cancellation policy. The promise cannot be voided out by anybody. Now, my wife will tell you, I don't drink anything when I'm talking about milk close to the expiration date. Because I worked in a grocery store. I told y'all about that, right? I worked in a grocery store. And when they trained me to stock the shelves, they trained me to put the good stuff in the back and the old stuff up front. So today is November the 9th. If I was still working at Publix Grocery Store um, on Orange Blossom Trail in Orlando and then on Kirkman Road, what I would do 
I would put the milk November 12th and November 13th up front. And I would put November 18th and November 20th in the back. And what y'all used to do, come in there and reach all the way back to the dot dog on back and take my good milk and then take my good milk and then leave the old milk up there. And we had to go pour the milk out. So what I had to start doing, leaving November 10th, 11th and 12th up front and taking the big crates and sitting them behind in the freezer where we put them in the, in the, in the little shelves. We used to then hide them back there so y'all couldn't go get it. So y'all was forced to buy November 10th, 11th, and 12th. And then when y'all bought all that up, then we brought the 18th, 19th, and 20th up because people don't want to buy nothing close to the expiration date. Paul said the good news about the promise, I don't care when you get in, it still don't have no expiration. You can get in on the end of it and it has no cancellation policy. Your sins can't even cancel it. And that's the good news tonight. And I'm done. It's 801. And so that was the promise and the law. So we got part five done and we got part six. Somebody ought to say amen tonight. All right. Y'all have a good night. We done been, that's, that's a whole lot of talking. I'm ready to go to bed now. It's past my bedtime. This new daylight saving or whatever it is, getting dark at five o'clock, make me go to bed at seven o'clock. So it messes me up. Uh, makes me get up at 4.35 o'clock because the sun started coming up. And I think it's 7, 8 o'clock. So I'm already up and walking around, rolling. All right. Love y'all. Can't wait to see y'all on Sunday morning. I hope, hope you got something out of this lesson on tonight. I hope you got something out of this lesson. I see Miss Sarita Hill all the way from Macon, Georgia, had surgery today and she's on here. We're praying uh, God's blessings and healing even upon her uh on, and tonight and her whole team down there at making be of eoc and she had to undergo surgery y'all have a good night love y'all have a good night see cassandra barnes is on here as well she had yeah. surgeons recovering uh so many stories and testimonies we also have people uh talk to uh miss kim dowdell yesterday her uh her significant other passed away um they were in an accident a couple of weeks ago so we're, we're praying for all of our families and Crystal Oliver buries her mother tomorrow. Uh, so many things going on. Um, I was at a, a wait tonight uh, of our officer uh, who lost his life, uh, young man in, in his 20s. Well, would, would that be 20, uh, 2003, 2013? Uh, that's 20, 2023. He's been 30, so he was 29. He was born in 1993. Uh, one of our young officers born in 1993 and uh, uh, laying in a casket. And his mother wept on my shoulder uncontrollably. His mother was executive assistant uh, to the CEO at St. Michael's Hospital. And of course, with me being the chairman, uh, Maria Barbosa had to work with me uh, on so many things. And she had to have retired and had to fly back in and to bury her son. And to see that wife grieving with that newborn baby and to see uh, his siblings and mother and father. And she said, Pastor, will you please, please, I believe God hears your prayers. That's what she said to me. And she hugged me and brought a whole family. Uh, and they all hugged me and I prayed with them right there in front of the casket, room full of politicians, director. I had to take off my deputy director hat and put on my pastor slaughter hat uh, to be with that family. So enjoy your life. Enjoy your life. And enjoy your life because you do unfortunately have an expiration date the promise don't have an expiration but you have one and i have one love y'all may the lord be with you and may the lord bless you see y'all on sunday morning have a great night have a great night